I am joined with my gravelly voice by a less gravelly voice in Anne Lord Jackson. Hello, Anne. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening. Lovely to be here. Yes, slightly dodgy voice today, but hey, we'll get past that. Um, right, central health. Last week we were looking at birthdays, um, and in particular, we took the angle of celebrating the persons who's actually having the birthday because we we think about other people don't we but this was how do we actually focus on that one person focusing on them with their sensory needs and not ignoring everybody else's but actually making that point once once a year of saying you know what this person is really special mm, that's a lovely thing a really precious time because it is the only day in the year that actually you are allowed and i think we we ought to celebrate people <clears throat> for sure we really really should now the other idea i thought i'd had we've had two hospital experiences uh myself heart surgery and then our operations manager had emergency had only surgery very recently so mm -hmm. hospitals are very much in my mind <clears throat> um, it's quite an overloading um time emotionally mm. but i was thinking about the some of the sensory issues of different environments um for example before we dive in i went to see Stephen in hospital he's in his room and it is so 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 hot He's in there in shorts and sweating. And I'm thinking, I feel ill. And then you realize the temperature is incredibly hot because they've got to be warm because of heating. The windows don't have any protection. So it's really hot to what we're used to. That's just one example of one situation of both of our hospital treatments, which I just thought, hmm, how we, we can talk about that and how we can sort of try and mitigate some of those things. But let's just roll the clock back to my surgery uh, and how this can affect, because I'm really passionate that this, whole area of, of sensory health it's not just for children is it this this is something to affect every single one of us absolutely yeah yeah it'd be great to, to 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 hear right so um hospital let's just go through that because it's something that many of us will uh, go through at some point in our life we may just have to help somebody else or it may be ourselves going through that but um, I'm preparing for hospital so already we're not even at the door of the hospital I'm in my own home my own surroundings I'm already feeling very overloaded and very overwhelmed, worrying, I guess, mm. about heart surgery, which I think is understandable. When mm. I'm there, did you get a good sleep? No, I didn't sleep a wink last night. I could not sleep. Were you worried? Not especially, but I just couldn't sleep. Oh, yes, that's normal. So there's the first one. I'm already exhausted before I even get to hospital. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going. So now my senses are already, you know, I'm not in a good place because now I'm tired. So my body, whatever I might have done of resting and trying to take pressure off my day, I'm now at hospital and I'm already exhausted. So that's not great. You're then in the hospital bed and you know they're going to put a needle in you at some point. So now your anxiety is rising because you're thinking, I don't care how good you are. You've still mm -hmm. got to stick a needle through my skin. It's going to hurt. So yep. all the way through, before we even get to surgery, you're in an uncomfortable place. You've got to put a really unpleasant gown on, which is itchy and scratchy. I had hospital pants, which are horrid, sort of mesh things, very uncomfortable. So you've got all these pinches and scratchy and scraping. The lightness, the, my goodness, the lighting. Seriously, do you need to have that many lights on? Um, the noise, all of that's there. How can we best help people prepare for being unprepared in a sense because you can't really prepare for it how do we best help people prepare for just the trip in to being ready for surgery uh, it's huge well, everything that you go through any any time you go out of your home even that's why we have so many people who just want to be at home all the time and, that, and that's totally understandable but we, we can't function always at home so that's the process of getting outside the house and being in an environment <laughs> that, you, that you can't control what, what do we do about it um, I think the, the, the element you knew a bit of what, of what to expect. So those expectations, if you could have had, or for some people, it would be going, um, to experience the actual same ward. If you can get a visit beforehand, so you can actually see what are the lights like? Um, is there something that you can do to change perhaps the color or the dimming of the light? Or would you just pack an extra pair of sunglasses? Um, would you would you have a look at, at some some tints of things if you want to read in the bed? But the lights are going to be that. If you can't switch them off, can you can you put a tinted uh, overlay over the top of stuff that you'll read? Because you're, you're going to be there all the time. Um, looking at your phone, can you change the settings on your phone for the brightness and colours? Um, just the how 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 big the print. Normal kind of accessibility things. It's just just paying extra attention. 
um, to those things and making sure if you're if you're aware again if you just had a visit you're you're a lot more aware of of, of the level of sounds that that are going to be coming um preparing those things bringing things in that you can listen to instead the types of music it's just an awful lot of of pre-planning and, and preparation and i don't know if hospitals can give you if you're going for surgery, they need certain things a certain way. But whether there's ways of preparing the skin, for some people we would do. Um, we would do the rubbing as some form of, of massage of deep touch pressure or of getting them physically active to get a good dose of proprioceptive input into their systems first. But that's going to wane within a couple of hours because if you're there for a long time, and in surgery, you're not going to be able to get that activity. But if you know it's going to be for a short time or a shorter surgery, you absolutely check out what, if you can, at the sensory environment, but make sure that you get a good amount of um, swimming, trampolining, running, something, biking to the hospital, whatever would work for you to try and help your system to be able to cope with the extra overload that it is going to get because the environment is different. I hadn't thought of shades. I had remembered... I didn't actually take them, but I had remote like a, a, an eye patch, like a silk blackened eye patch thing. I'd forgotten that one, but actually shade is another way of not completely blocking out the light, just massively reducing it whilst you're in and awake and alert, which I was for most of the time. I, I was supposed to be awake for various parts. Um, so an eye patch would have been unhelpful. So I didn't wear one, but I hadn't thought about shades. And it's worth getting um, almost a, a variety. So because some sunglasses are really dark. Um, and, th and they would be good. And there's other times you actually want to see a little bit more. And other times you just want to take the the, the edge mm. off, especially they, most of them have fluorescent lights or if, if they're moving into LEDs, but they're still bright. And most of the time, if you're on your back, then you're staring straight up at them, which isn't great. So having if three three pairs of sunglasses, if you can, just because then you, you can adjust according to quite where you're at. Mm. Um, well. I guess also following on from uh, birthdays or celebrating one person, there's a lot of being in hospital, which you're out of control of, mm -hmm. but have to work through, which is why it's not wise to say, well, I can't cope with anything else. So I'll never, ever experience anything that I can't cope with, because at some point you're going to, um, mm -hmm. and you need to build up some sort of level of tolerance against such things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I guess in hospital, it's, it actually follows on because there's a lot I couldn't, I couldn't turn the lights off because they need to see me it's it's important it matters mm. i want them to be able to see me uh we we don't want noise and walls everywhere because the nurses station they need to see all the patients so having complete isolation and privacy well that isn't going to work either so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we may not like that actually we do like the reason for even if we don't like the actual application mm. and i think to be able to also say that the nurses needs to be able to see me so therefore i can cope better with the lack of privacy with with the with with all the visual stuff that i can see um because it's more important for them so we can use our cognitive function we can use our thinking huh. to a point to to moderate and and, and to modulate that those senses a little bit and it helps us if we keep breathing and keep keep talking to ourselves using using the positive talk and the those cognitive skills to help us through those situations because we just we, we just need to be able to cope as best we can it's never going to be ideal it's never going to be ideal it's just trying to make it as um as capable if not pleasurable as, as possible now one of the things that struck me of my time which was scheduled i had the appointment for so many months ahead so it was always going to be happening stephen had emergency surgery so he went into hospital in lots of pain and was operated on that day but the one thing that struck me as fascinating and i really i still am is both of us took a book thinking we're going to read we know we're going to be in hospital we're going to read um me because i knew that i was going to be conscious i was never going to be under a general anesthetic so all the way through i was awake okay i'll take a book from when i come out i'll read Stephen took a book thinking well i'm going to be bored waiting around for whatever's going to happen and then as it happened surgery and waiting neither of us wanted to read a book at all mm. and we love reading with that one through me <laughs> Uh, yeah <laughs> and that we, we just don't know what our brain can but it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of focus and actually on the one hand it's, it's a great distraction but it also does take when you don't have the energy when you when your whole body has been assaulted for want of a better word it not intentionally but it is definitely what our bodies are not designed to do our bodies are to, designed to live in health and to be well to have somebody even go near you never mind about cut you open or even stick a 
you know, <laughs> stick something in you is, is an injection. That's not the norm. That that's our our, our bodies aren't and our minds and our senses aren't designed for for the, for that assault. It's never done in an assaultive way. It's done in pure love and to bring healing, and we know all of that. But our our actual response to it, we we do what we can to to, to cope and to rationalise it, but we never will be able to completely because it is an assault on on our bodies. One of the things I noticed the hospital had done, I guess, to calm people down, to give them something um, that isn't medical to look at, for want of a better description, uh, were paintings on the walls. And there's always been a bit of a joke about hospital painting. But I actually looked at one. I thought, Do you know, that's not bad. It was just a beautiful woodland scene. I thought, it's OK, actually. It would be nice if it was a picture. I think that would look better, probably more expensive. Um, but actually, it was nice to have something to focus on that wasn't a nurse wasn't a blood pressure monitor or a, a really dodgy looking curtain that's hanging down a bit or it was nice to have something else to see yeah that's lovely and those little things and the, the colors of the wards um yeah th there's lots of things that can be done but it is nice to have something visual that you can hook onto um and and, and use that, that visual system to help bring that that calming in into your own and take your imagination somewhere else to distract um to yeah distract is good from where you are in hospital distraction is very very pleasant yeah. um right okay so let's we've we've sort of gone through the the pre-surgery thing um Stephen had no warning because it wasn't scheduled so it was much more uh aggressively handled in that sense in a good way so he arrives at eight o'clock by ten o'clock he's basically he's gone through his surgery in the evening i still think that's very quick that's less than 12 hours effectively by the time it had all happened but for him um he just went through in, in a sense, it was slightly easier because I was bracing myself for months. He had mm -hmm. literally a few hours. So I suppose it kind of condensed the, um, it concentrated the, the stress in a sense. And I wondered, is that easier or not? And what you think? Oh, that's fascinating. And that's where it comes to an occasion, whether you're going on holiday, whether you're moving house, whether you're Christmas, whether it's you know, starting school, whether you're starting a new job, whether you're going for a driving test. Sometimes, uh, well, actually, the driving test doesn't fit into this, this equation about what I'm going to say, but those life events where that's totally individual as to whether it's good to give warning. There are so many times when I'm talking about we need to do countdowns or how many sleeps or we have visual timetables or we have a plan of, of the preparation and you, and you X through the days leading up to the event. But there are some people who that is just going to send their anxieties through the roof. Their arousal levels just get higher and higher and higher the closer you get to the day. So you're better to only bring it on them. Like, like Stephen, on that day, basically, obviously not, not the greatest experience to be that, you know, that affected so that it's an emergency that, that surgery is done. But that it, it does save the build up. You have all of that. You just need a little time at the other end often to recuperate and to process and just think, goodness me, what has just happened to me? So there is a build up before and then there is also the recovery time after. And I think those are likely to be a little bit different according to their preparation. But that's where you really need to know yourself. You need to know your family. You need to know who you're working with as to whether you're better just to tell them on the day. Look, we're going off on holiday to tell them on the day. This is what we're doing. And it's a bit different or whether you do need that build up. And that's trial and error. And also maturity, things will change um, as well as, as individuals get older um, or they get more resourceful or they're more able to use their mind to control their reactions. And that there, there's a lot to it, but there is it's definitely worth paying attention to as to the amount of warning that you give someone and the preparation for something. And some people it's, yeah, no, don't don't give the preparation. Just go and do. Uh, now, I don't want to go through the medical stuff because that's not really necessarily relevant. But the one thing that I did want to sort of pick on from a sensory perspective was um, Stephen was under general anaesthetic, so he was completely out. But in my procedure, I was actually fully conscious and needed to be. So I was very aware, sedated and then painkillers, but I was very aware of what was going on around me. But what I thought was interesting was physically, I'm basically restrained. Um, I'm not actually strapped down. It's not that sort of restraint that could happen, I guess. For me personally, I was just don't move. <laughs> so that's quite a good motivator um, because we're inside your heart and you don't want to move because mm. then we have to start again. And so the thing that I think about from a sensory perspective, there are times in our lives where we literally are out of physical control. 
I don't mean having a rage attack. I don't mean that. I mean, like literally things are happening. We can't control. So I'm lying on a little tiny narrow bed being operated on, but all I've got left is my brain because I can't do anything else. I can't wiggle my toes because they ain't moving. Um, I can't move my arms because that's really bad. Uh, I can't read a book. So literally I've got my mind left, but how do we best use our minds the way that God designed us to be in regards to our sensory health, when there's nothing else we can do about the rest, which for all of us at various points, we're going to find ourselves in on a bus journey. You're in the power of the bus driver. You're at the power of the other, you know, effectively power of the, the other, the other uh, people on the bus. So how do we best use our minds as God designed us to be for the best sensory health in mm. scenarios where we no longer control the physical surroundings? Mm. That's that's a, that's a powerful thing to think about because we're, we're told to take captive every thought. Yeah. Um. Sometimes that that sort of we, we see that as a, as a spiritual thing, but absolutely take it taking captive the things that you are thinking as you are sitting there or lying there, and what we don't want to happen, which can happen, is that when you start to get aware of sensory health and sensory processing and how your senses are responding to things, it can heighten you it can make you more aware of those things when you weren't aware of them before mm. and you were just acting subconsciously and you just avoided things or you just did things differently when when you start to become aware of it you can actually become more heightened more sensitive to it so that's when it's really important to be able to use our minds to be able to help moderate that and recognize it and say that smell I don't like it, but what 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 can I think of instead to be able to help perceive that? And that's where you need the power. That's where you want to be able to use the power of your brain to try and change or to um to, to dampen down or to think about something else as to what that um especially if it's a, if it, if it triggers a memory, we need to try and find another memory, replace it, use your imagination so that the it, it you're not your arousal levels aren't increased, but they're actually decreased through using your your mind. Uh, that won't work all the time. And that's not often where I would want to go because we want to change the sensory perception. We want to change the processing yeah. patterns. And that's that's what I do in my job. So you, we want to change the senses because it's just so much easier. We don't need the mind to get involved. Let's just get the body working better with the brain. But when when you have no nothing else and you've only got your mind, let's use your mind to control your breathing better to at least get oxygen and then use your imagination to be aware of the senses that you're feeling or not feeling and replace it with uh, positive positive thoughts shift and you use your imagination beautifully to, to to make it a more positive experience than, than negative and try and reduce how overreactive you are to to sensations if if they're bothering you it makes me think of I know you think I think left field, but it makes me think of a car traveling down a hill. If you take it out of gear because you want to save a little bit of fuel, which in principle you could do, um, now you're running the risk of not being in control of the vehicle. But actually, rather than putting it not into a gear, I know this doesn't work with an automatic car, but manual cars in the UK, uh, you, you stick it into neutral. Now the car is just going to roll down the hill. But now you haven't got access to proper braking. So actually, the best way of going down the hill is to leave it in a gear so you're actually using the engine. In the same context, what you're saying, I think, is when you're in hospital, don't just allow your brain just to go wherever it chooses. Take every thought captive. And therefore, if you're thinking of something, you're actually using your brain rather than risking the engine cutting out, you know, uh, just free thought and panic and terror. Actually, if you're using it, that's a much more productive way because then you're utilizing the power of the mind, which is very, very powerful. Yeah, that that's beautiful. So if you've got that light overhead, just a, just an example, you've you've got the light overhead, and it's just like okay, that that's really that's really bright. I don't like that. That that's really not helpful. And then think, well, actually, is there a time when were you ever lying down on the beach? Um, is there a time that you really had some lovely a lovely sunshine, a, like a, a heat or a warmth? And try and then bring bring that perception of of warmth and heat and good experiences of, of lying on the beach which might be completely off for some people because they hate the feel of sand but <laughs> um find something that's positive and thinking actually that that could be or lying down in a field and looking up at the sky use using those experiences for positive so therefore as you say keeping the car in gear uh, so that you can actually use it for positive rather than just being overwhelmed 
by by the situation because you're just so passive. We don't want to be passive in those situations. I guess you're either in control of your mind and what's going on, or it will inadvertently, not deliberately, control you. Mm. Mm. Right. Uh, another one that came to mind that I think really will touch on anybody who's got anybody who they are supporting, who might have a, a, and perhaps more the an extreme central health struggle. Um, but when I'm lying in bed after surgery, I'm not allowed to move for six hours. I have to lie there because they've gone through the vein um, and I'm on blood thinners. Therefore, please don't move, Mr. Barry. We really need your thigh to heal. So don't move. So I'm lying on a bed for roughly six to seven hours, awake, unable even to flinch. I wasn't even allowed to readjust my legs. It's like, well, if you want to move, if you're not comfortable, we will move your leg. Do not use your muscles. But I was thinking about having worked with um, particularly people in wheelchairs is what was in my mind. They must get really uncomfortable and not necessarily know that there's a little ripple of a blanket that now is sort of pinching the skin underneath. Mm. But how can we best as a carer of somebody, um, whether it's uh, a, a friend of mine who's caring for his wife, who's, who's in a wheelchair. So he has to think about her needs. Can't just chuck her in a wheelchair and off she goes. That's You can't do that because he, well, he cares for a start. But how do we best make sure that we're using the right sort of blanket and stuff? How, how can we think, well, sensory health, just basic skin, not, not fingers and touch, which are obviously very, very uh, sensitive, but less sensitive areas like elbows or um, bottoms on chest. How can we best help somebody that that isn't then the only thing they can focus off because it hurts or it irritates? Mm, yes, I'm right, thinking back to when I was working in in a hospital and and I was in the in the, in the cushions for, for for the wheelchairs and we really had to be really really careful about the cushions that we were putting people on. Some of the pressure sores were horrendous, and I'm so glad I wasn't a nurse because I would see the nurses come and clean. Sorry if anybody who's you know squeamish or whatever that the nurses would have to come and clean out these sores that were inches wide um like yeah and uh, just because they'd been sitting on that area not able to perceive the the sensation um didn't have good uh pressure sore pressure uh cushions and, and other things like that to be able to protect them so we we really do need to think for other people who don't have that tactile feedback um to be able to reposition themselves or don't have that physicality just to lift themselves up on the chair and move themselves every or on a regular basis um but yeah it is it, it's, it's a really important part of caring because those those pressure sores or that that discomfort um that that's huge it, it's very not nice <laughs> So um, in hospital, I was assigned a particular nurse who would care for me mostly during during the time I was there, which was only for a day for me. Uh, but she said, I just need to check. I'm really sorry. This is a little bit, you know, you're not for private, but I need to check your bottom and your back to make sure there's nothing, no marks there. So that when you have been lying for a long time, I can know whether they were there before or whether it's something like a bed sore um, that we need to then actually be careful of. Now, in fairness, for me, my particular surgery, they wanted me on my feet very quickly. Mm -hmm. The faster you're standing up, the better, the faster you'll heal. For Stephen, it's quite different. Uh, we want you to rest because you've had a hernia operation. Don't lift anything. It was even more extreme than what I've been given as instructions. Um, but I was I was just thinking about how we, we we care for others, but it's very hard to know what they're thinking, which is why I was thinking about the, the part when I was lying down in surgery, unable to move, and all that happened was my mind, because actually if you're if you're if you're caring for somebody who's got some some physical health issues they're in a wheelchair they're in a bed um they they struggle you know how can we best serve them but part of that i'm guessing which is where my little brain's going is well yes we can care for the blankets and the cushions and make sure there aren't bed sores because they can't sense that but also helping them to keep their minds active which comes back to what we were saying because rather than just sitting there which would be bad we want their minds to be engaged and active even if they can't speak for example or you know perhaps they can't hear and we don't do sign language well there are things we can do to communicate to keep the mind going because the mind is the bit that gets all the senses especially smell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like we we're just looking that this week looking at what you think um it kind of like it, it drives everything doesn't it you know what, what, what you think drives your behavior um and, and it's like how do how do we get those those thought processes right so that we can be in in the best place and, and the healthiest place to survive operations and, and and to survive things that happen to us that we really we're very thankful for but we actually would rather they didn't happen to us i guess my experience of hospital got me thinking about some of the extremes that i went through that aren't extremes for others so me lying on a bed for six hours unable to move is an extreme for me 
for some of the people that I worked with when I was 16 doing work experience, that was their life. They they don't get to sit up without help and assistance. Um, some of those some of those things were the lights. The lights are super bright. In fact, a nurse did say, oh, I'm sorry, we forgot to turn them down. Uh, let me just you know dim them slightly for you. You know, so she did she did clock it, but I'd been lying there looking up at a really bright light, thinking I'm going to be blind by the end of this. Um, but but there are things that we can do, but it's it's working with the body and with the mind. But my experience really made me think of all the extremes for me that were heightened because I went in tired, I went in exhausted. If you're dealing with a, a child or an adult with some additional struggles, whether it's physical, emotional, they don't have tactile touch or they can't see, like I said, all, all the other senses now are going to be huge. I was lying in bed for six hours, unable to move, and I had an itch. And it's amazing oh. how much I was able to focus on the itch. Oh. I tried to focus on anything else, thinking... I don't know that I really want to ask for help from a nurse just for an itch on my back because I know it's going to take several of them because this is really important. So I just try to focus on anything else. And I actually was able to get my brain off the itch, which is how God made us to be. We've got powerful minds. We have got powerful minds, but goodness me, that that's that. Oh, that that's a hard thing. <laughs> it itches like they're like what what goes on in the skin system there is a specific neural pathway that takes up an itch yeah <laughs> it's like god well, where did that come from it's like <laughs> why why do we have itches i mean there are so many questions i tell you like it's just like lord would you just put, fill me in on that one because like it's just bizarre um but very satisfying when you can actually get to it if you can't get to it goodness me that's like torture but um <laughs> yeah <I> <laughs> Think about pain and itching. I remember a guy, uh, Dr. Neil T. Anderson uh, from the States, and he was talking about feet. And he was talking about a stone in the shoe. And the oh. example, I think, which is really powerful, he said, if you have a stone in the shoe, it hurts. We can get irritated by the fact that it hurts and take the stone out. Or we can just keep walking. But the reason why it's good to suffer pain when you've got a stone in your show, shoe is if you don't know it's there and you can't feel that pain, you will eventually make yourself effectively a cripple because you will destroy your foot because that stone will keep pressing and eventually, eventually you will have no ability to use that foot. It's going to be damaged. It's going to have open sores. You could make even break a bone. You won't know. So actually that little stone, the pain of that, the irritation as it starts is a really good thing to do something. And I guess that's part of what I'm thinking about in sensory health as well, that, that some of those things are irritations, irritable stuff, but that irritation might not be aggression. I suppose it could be, but it, it might just be, this hurts. This is frustrating. I can't think this. I can't smell this. I can't hear that. But actually that then just becomes something more, doesn't it? And that's where we need to learn how to live well, treat what we can and learn how to um, accommodate, adapt and live with it so that we can flourish through it rather than it really get destructive because these things can get destructive and the anger and the, the, the there's a lot of negative things that, that can come the depression the anxiety so many negatives and we just we don't want to go there and we don't need to go there and um, we just need that combination of understanding what is going on from a sensory perspective our sight sound smells our feelings the way that our bodies move or can't move especially when you've been put in a position where you can't move you know, for six hours and what impact that has on your body. So yeah, treat where we can, manage it well and accommodate and uh, and accept rather than it regress into the depression, the uncoordination, the anxiety, the hitting out, the kicking, the screaming, uh, the, the violence, the stuff that it can lead to. Um, just moving straight through the medical stuff, which isn't necessarily most relevant with sensory health, but um, I'm thinking about sort of post post-care side of things. Uh, because Stephen and I went through some similar experiences of feeling very vulnerable because mm. we can't do things. And that particularly, that really made me think, because I guess part of the feeling of vulnerability is because we were not vulnerable before, which is why when you are vulnerable, it's so much more heightened. Well, I was okay on my, on my own before, and now I can't even go out for a walk on the road outside because now I really am actually unable to react. And that also got me thinking about sensory needs for people who are struggling because that feeling of vulnerability was was very raw because I had not been vulnerable before. And I knew I would stop being vulnerable in a while. But if you're in a situation where you can't help and you can't feel and you can't see and you can't touch, it's difficult. Friend of mine, uh, ex-veteran from the army, he's he's burned his hand so many times on engines and trucks and stuff. He's lost the senses. So now he can burn really easily because he literally can't 
feel so it's usually his nose that tells him he's being burned mm. um so i mean there's there's a whole raft of stuff in there of sort of post-operative vulnerability emotional stuff how can we use the senses to help us get best through those heightened times of feeling vulnerable because you actually are mm. Uh, that's that's that self-care when people talk about the self-care it's using thankfully because the senses are so easy to to soothe um and, and to use positively to help us feel good because that's what they're designed to sensory integration is another word for fun so when you're doing things that are fun and enjoyable you know that your senses are processing well so it'll be using what, whatever it is that works for you but but taking care it is is very much what, what are the activities that are going to nourish me that are going to re um, regenerate um, what what has been lost, and and sometimes it might just even be, especially cuddling, you know, that that warmth or an electric blanket or um, just a, a something to wrap yourself in or a warm bath. Often those feelings, especially that where you can enclose yourself, because. You, that's less of you are protecting yourself when you bring your arms in when something is covering you and that helps that that with that vulnerability because emotionally you're quite open it's like in praise and worship when hands go up and arms go up and we're we're outside we're very very vulnerable in that physical posture and i think that's that's how i've learned and, and grown in worship because i i am much more open now than i ever used to be i didn't i didn't understand it. i didn't get it <laughs> um whereas now it's just like i just want to be completely vulnerable before you god and therefore we are physically open so i would start with the body you know that protection and, the, and that and that calming whether it be from a loved one or just the things that you can have around your house that will give you those experiences of being warm and safe and cuddled and soft i know for my family they were great when i came out i was very um delicate i think it's probably the right word mm -hmm. and they spoke very very softly and very gently and um there was a level of i suppose super soft <laughs> i was wrapped in cotton wool for a while Mm. which actually was really good now we've talked before haven't we about how it's not good to always put cotton wool around your children they need to experience life to some degree but actually they kind of wrapped me in cotton wool for a couple of weeks and do you know what it was really healthy part of my healing oh, to yeah. feel so safe that i could learn to explore i had to learn to walk again yeah the nurse said you need to learn to walk again you're not walking correctly get it right or you will not thank me for telling you and she was right i had to learn to walk again because i'm now walking around a sore around a, a you know a wound on my inner thigh mm. and so it took me a good few weeks to be able to walk in a straight line like I normally did with one foot in front of the other mm. and not shuffling so there's that's just one thing I had to read it and that took so much um energy to sense what my feet were doing to look at what my feet were doing to use my ears my senses to think my feet are dragging again and I'm I'm, I'm scuffing the floor so I had to use all the senses mm. And I was exhausted, not so much from recovery, but trying to walk by using every single one of my senses to relearn something I knew I should be able to do. I did do, I could do just two days ago, and now I can't. And that's the, the exhaust. That is exhaustion. That, that is so many, many of my families of the people that I work with. The tiredness is one of the biggest things because of the amount of effort that it takes to concentrate on things that should be automatic. The amount of pressure that you put, the, like your handwriting, sitting up still, sitting up straight, uh, communicating, being part of a, a an environment that has sights and sounds and smells. and But for some of our people, yeah, it, it's just as you've described, that exhaustion, because the amount of conscious effort it takes to to do things that ordinarily were automatic and that you did well, but you're having to go back to scratch and, and learn it properly. Um, when Stephen was starting to walk again outside, I realised as I was getting him to walk properly because he was all stiff and sort of weird gait and whatever, I noticed that one of my feet was sticking out as I walked, which I've <laughs> never had before. And I thought, that's from all of this stuff I've done. So as I was watching him, I saw myself and thought, my foot's wrong. So I had to correct my foot back to a, you know, straight. <laughs> um, but it's interesting how we can lose things that we are routinely doing and they disappear. But actually, as I used my, one of my senses to spot his feet, I spotted my own feet. And then I heard, because I sort of blocked it out, I guess, I'd heard my foot scuffing. So I corrected it again. And now it's fine. It didn't take me more than, you know, one walk to fix it. But this is very easy to fall out of things that we're good at, isn't it? Mm, mm hmm yeah absolutely it's funny i'm i'm distracted i can hear other things going on in, in the household that i normally don't and i like and just feel my my whole just my whole brain is, is totally distracted by things that are happening because there's beeping and, the, and the, the, there's moving and stuff going on at the minute so it, i'm sorry i'm just totally aware of, of what the senses have done to my concentration level of focus 
But that's what happens when we're talking about people with sensory needs. We're talking about people who are, in some t- some cases, they are they are permanently distracted because everything is too much. Yeah, totally. And we need to understand what it is about them, their sensory thumbprint, and how to to really help them and help them thrive. And the sensory thumbprint, of course, is what you do. Not necessarily um, as easy when you're going in for emergency surgery, but if you've got <laughs> other daily life things, then actually that's when that can really start to to make a huge difference because it's about daily living. And the bit I love about what you do is not just sensory health; it's the occupational therapy bit of how can we not just help people do okay, but actually live amongst the people amongst the world amongst working it's it's more than just feeling better it's feeling better in order to do yes yes to do the job of living occupational therapy <laughs> oh in fact october is going to be occupational therapy month i think oh, there you are didn't know that okay. everybody has a their own month these days or days <laughs> I think it's also sensory processing awareness month as well. I'm, I'm not really good. I'm not really up on these things. I just see these things flash through my feed every now and again. Thinking, oh, yes, I probably ought to pay attention to that. But no, <laughs> I've got too many other things to be doing that actually, yeah, make a difference. I just, yeah, let me get on and do what I need to do. All right. Um, thank you, Anne. If you've got any questions, you can email them to us. Hello at pure247radio.org. Hello at pure247radio.org. And I'll put your questions to Anne. And if you want to find her on the website, just go to pure247radio.org forward slash a l j and it will take you to Anne's website thank you Anne, as ever and we'll see you again soon oh it's great to chat thank you